This is a Best in Climate episode of Earth Feels, where each week your hosts Rose and Christine read to you from some of the best climate-related blogs and articles on the web. Hi, Rose here. So today marks the beginning of week five of self-quarantine for me here in California. And though I'm in Southern California, I began my journey to isolation when the Bay Area shut down. It just felt right. So I might be a bit ahead of the curve. There's been so much written about what we should or could accomplish during this time. Weight loss, decluttering, gardening, learning a new language, playing a musical instrument. And as fruitful as all that sounds, I'm essentially a woman without a country being sequestered here in San Diego, albeit in a lovely Airbnb. So rather than produce, my time has been spent slowing down, reading, sitting in stillness, listening to the birds, examining the bark on trees, navel gazing, as us old hippies are wont to say, and deliciously with no sense of guilt. The slowdown has given me time to breathe, to make the journey inward, to travel into that space of my inner knowing, where my only job, my sole responsibility, is to listen deeply to what wants to be heard. I believe synchronicity is the universe talking. In trusting my intuition, I've been gifted with some incredible connections, not the least of which is Laura Lentz, whose writing I am about to share. It's beyond fascinating to me that Laura is a writing instructor who lives on the island of Kauai, where, had we not been forced into self-quarantine, I would be right now. And if I told you I had been traveling to Kauai every year for the past 25 years, and yet Laura and I had never met Would it seem like mere coincidence that her post should cross my feet at this time? I prefer to see it as a bit of magic. I believe Laura's message was given to me to share with you. So here goes. And there's no title to this. It was just Laura's post on Facebook. My mother sang to the spiders that had the good fortune of coming into our house. No matter their poisons, she cupped them in her hands and carried them outside, placing them in her legendary garden. Undaunted by my arachnophobia over the years, she called me out to watch a tarantula marching across our patio with five babies behind her. To me, it was something out of a Stephen King novel. I couldn't look, and I couldn't look away. It was terrifyingly beautiful. And when I and the neighborhood kids caught and separated the blinking abdomen of fireflies and made necklaces out of them, parading through the neighborhood lit up, my mother wasn't there. And she wasn't there when I put frogs in boxes and forgot they were in the hot sun on pavement while they suffocated. When I became a young adult, I was attracted to the concrete of city and museums and billboards and neon and exhaust fumes and fashion. And I left the land I grew up on, where the Shawnee Indian tribe once thrived. I dug their arrowheads from the earth, and they lined the cracked windowsill of my childhood bedroom. And as I grew, I dove into the selfish life, which at first feels like a cool ocean with no riptides, no undertow, just gentle waves. I became an executive. I started my own company. I thrived. I lived in big houses. I collected things, and more things. Thought I was doing my part by buying a Prius. Then I became restless for something I couldn't name, couldn't call out, something I couldn't find in a contract or a bank account or between the thighs of a man, something I couldn't find hiking the Santa Monica Canyon on a Saturday afternoon, braving the two-hour drive on the 405 to get to the hike and a longer drive back, picking up lattes on the way. I got sick, so sick, one cancer, another, and then my father died. That's when the wrens and the bluebirds from my childhood came back, the robins, 
the small blue eggs, my mother's gardens, the petunias, the zinnias, the bulbs she buried deep in the earth that lodged underneath her orange fingernails. That's when I realized the weeping willow tree across from my home saved my life, and the moon and Jupiter and Venus grounded me from the cold crabgrass on my front lawn as I traveled up. That's when I knew the brown cedar lakes that held my body on hot summer days. Watching the clouds was still on my skin. I could never wash off those summers. Somewhere along the way, I longed to be near an ocean again. Sit on a hot rock, bury my feet, talk with sheep, and commune with horses. I wanted to be on the verge of a night clearing and apologize to the fireflies. I wanted to tell my story of my mother dropping to her knees and screaming when she saw the construction crew had taken all the trees off our property, despite her direction to save them when building our home. My mother crying, mourning a forest with her whole body, her tears wetting our new, barren land. I was standing next to her then, only two. I couldn't possibly understand her grief, but I'm telling you, her grief for those trees lives in my DNA. And the land my childhood home was built on lives inside me. It took me years to have my heart fully break, the way it is fully broken now, with the worry that when this nightmare virus ends, when it's finally over, who knows how long, who knows how many months, how many dead, how many more freezers will be needed, I'm worried we will go back to the life we had before, to the world where I consume, where I overconsume, where I must have the convenience, the wanting, the taking, the stealing, will I return to being a bandit of earth again? When will I stop upgrading my iPhone, needing the latest, the newest, not caring whether the manufacturer hires 12-year-old children to put the parts together, that there are suicides around Christmas because humans can't keep up with the production and the consumer demand? When will I care what Walmart pays its employees so that I can have four of something cheaper? What if we look at COVID as the gift, the savior? What if we say, OMG, how can we change, look at our own stories, and finally invite Earth into our stories and our future? What if through this destruction, we learn who we are again, where we come from, What if it takes us all the way back? And what if I spread my palms and look at my own childhood hands that live inside them and see the destroyer and ask for forgiveness, the young girl who was in the killing fields, who did not respect the dance of the fireflies, the ways of the Indians, the ghosts that lived beside me growing up on what used to be a reservation? What if I allowed myself to go all the way back? and learn from my ancestors. Allow them to show me again. Through my breath, through my dreams, through my sacrifices, I will now willingly make. What if the only person who can save me is myself? Again, that piece was from author, creative coach, and writing teacher, Laura Lentz. Laura has been teaching themed writing workshops for over 10 years for writers, authors, and business owners. Her popular 12-week workshop, Story Quest, Make Your Story a Hero's Journey, was inspired by her 10 years of teaching and developmental editing. Through Story Quest, Laura distills the hero's journey to guide us to bring our own transformative stories to life on the page. Laura is the co-founder of Literati Academy and the StoryQuest community. I'll provide the appropriate links on earthfeelspodcast.com to make it easy for you to get in contact with her. Who knows? Maybe I'll see you at one of her upcoming writer's workshops. Because seriously, who wouldn't want to write like Laura? Thanks for listening. Catch you next time. That's this week's episode of Earth Feels. Special thanks to singer-songwriter Kristen Hoffman for generously allowing us to use song for the ocean. Thanks for listening. Don't forget, subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss an episode. Catch you next time. Bye-bye. 
children of the earth I'm calling out There's a mission for you and for 